Hi, I'm Lars, and welcome to This Old Mine. Welcome back, everybody. This is uh, the mill site that we've built for this old mine. What we're looking at right now is the rock crushers. We move over to the mill building, which has our shaker table in it and a workbench. Then from there, we move over to our hot work area. That's where we have our smelter, our furnace, and our roaster for our sulfide ores. We've been finding a lot of sulfide ores around here, but not a lot of uh, free mill yet. We anticipate doing both free mill and roasting. So let's get on to it. We're gonna take you through our process. Uh, we're gonna start off with our vibrating table, which uh, lets us sort out our ore grades before uh, crushing. So we can sort out our, our fine powdered stuff, which doesn't uh, need any crushing. That's a 300 minus mesh. And uh, you see the top screen there, that's quarter mesh. That uh, just keeps out the rocks, the birds, and the butterflies. Well, actually, that's the rock that will actually have to run through the crusher. The stuff that gets caught in the 300 mesh below will get run through the, uh, the flail mill, which is a chain mill that uh, crushes the ore down pretty well. So once it goes through the rock crusher or the jaw crusher, it uh, then automatically feeds down into the flail mill, so it's a two-step process. Uh, we're able to do pretty good-sized rocks. Now we're going to take the coarse rocks and dump them into one bucket. Then we're going to sift through the uh, next screen here and get some of our finer materials down. And once that's done sifting, we take the medium coarseness uh, stuff, the quarter inch or so, and uh, run that through the chain mill. Uh, we'll dump that into another bucket so we can sort out our, our different grades of, of dirt. We have fine, fine dirt, coarse dirt, and rock. And it makes a difference to the table which one you run. Uh, you can't run coarse dirt or rock across a shaker table. It just doesn't work. And the finer grade that we can get it milled down to, the better. Now this is what we get on our finds. This is like flour. Here's our coarse. Or anything that's bigger than 300 mesh that'll go through the chain mill and these are our very coarse our rock and those will go through this jaw crusher and the black pipe leading off to the right goes down to the chain mill now, I don't know what's going on here apparently there's enough vibration to cause the camera to jitter It'll kind of give you a, a wavy effect Anyhow, um, that opening was the where you put the rock. This is the motor. That's where you put the gasoline. This is the outfeed line. It goes down to our chain mill. And we uh, run everything wet to prevent uh, getting silicosis. Uh, you know, all the fine dust in the air. And we are running a lot of quartz rock, which uh, will give you silicosis. So we run everything wet. When it comes out of the chain mill, there's a screen on top of the bucket that uh, keeps us from getting large pieces in. And we run those back through the, the chain mill again. But uh, any of the water that comes through this system gets recycled. Uh, you'll see later on I have a underground uh, water reservoir with a couple of pumps. And that circulates the uh, water gives it a place to settle and uh, you'll see that uh, we actually get pretty clean water coming out not nothing you could drink but uh, you know pretty clear water into the system to start so we're not processing mud on top of our rock and we're going to open up the chain mill here and you'll see two chains in there those are actually well chains or flails they spin around and 
beat the heck out of the rock. Once the rock's small enough, it drops through a screen in the bottom and out that the black tube at the bottom into the bucket. But uh, inevitably, you get some rocks that don't make it through or some pebbles. And you want to check these because if you have any large gold or any nuggets that are in the system, they usually don't grind up. They just get beat and deformed. They don't break up. So we'll reprocess that. But, uh, yeah, just check and see if you've got, got any winners, any nuggets to start with. Unfortunately, on this run, we didn't get any nuggets. And unfortunately, on all the other runs, we didn't get any nuggets. Speed this up a little bit. And it's ready to go for the next time. I think this day we processed four buckets of a floor. Now this is the water recirculation tank. The water that you see coming out is the water from the, the chain flail, or from the rock crusher. We run everything into a bucket to help uh, separate out any large stuff that might get into the sump so that we can clean it out easier. And also we process it, we uh, pan it to make sure that we didn't lose anything through there. And you'll see that the back section, after the uh, bricks that are stacked up there, is actually is pretty clear. It's not, like I said, nothing you would drink, but it's you know it comes out pretty clear. You'll see on the table here. This is a shaker table that we built. Uh, we created a fiberglass uh, cat, or we created a mold, and then did a fiberglass cast on top of it, and it worked out pretty well. There are some things I'd change the next time around, but uh, I think if we're lucky the next time around, I'll just buy a professional job. So you see the water is pretty clear. The bubbles you see on it, that's uh, jet dry that's been added to the system. That keeps the fine gold particles from floating on the water. They'll, float, they'll actually float on top of water because of the... Uh, the surface tension of water and uh, you'll lose them so adding jet dry it actually causes them to sink so they'll stay down in the riffles work their way across the table into the uh, into the number ones trough which is the uh, trough where all your good stuff is supposed to go your number ones and number number twos are your good stuff your number threes are something you want to check to make sure you're not losing anything from number ones and twos and then our number four at the front uh, that's just waste material but we check that also to see if we're not losing anything uh, the table works pretty good you see the, the light brown is the uh, just the muds running off the top then uh, towards the center of the table that's their gang material then coming off to the left that's the uh, the sulfides, the irons, any heavy materials, hopefully some small particles of gold. So for a hack job, I think this turned out pretty well. We did use some duct tape on the table to help guide the materials where we want them. At times we get a lot of uh, sulfides coming through and they want to wash down into the twos or threes. So just a layer of duct tape, that gives the uh, sulfides a direction to go, and it's also not it's too high of a step for small pebbles to go across, so it washes clean. This is our three-station panning area. Like I said, we uh, check our ore that we're going to toss. We uh, pan some of it and make sure that we're not losing materials. Although inevitably you lose some material. Put a little squirt of jet dry in just to make sure we're not floating anything away. But if you try and get everything, you're working against the odds of diminishing returns. The more you work, the less you make. So as you're panning and tabling stuff down, you get the, the bulk of the material out that you want and some of the little stuff gets by and you just have to write it off. You could spend all day reprocessing and, and not get that much more material out. At least not enough to make it worth your while. 
Now this is going to cause some of you panners out there some stress because I'm really overloading this pan. I wouldn't suggest if you're doing any panning in the real world to, to do this. But I am panning into a tub which I can repan if I find that I'm losing materials. And this is our number fours. This is going to be mostly waste anyway. Now the pan I'm using is uh, has ridges on one side and uh, is smooth on the other. We'll kick this up a bit. Um, the the ridges help you hold heavy materials in while you're doing aggressive panning. And you'll see later on I'll turn the pan around when I get get my materials down. I'll turn the pan around and uh, wash out the wash it out from the smooth side. And now we're washing out from the, the smooth side, no ridges, so you gotta be a little bit slower, a little bit more careful. Now panning is an art. So you gotta do it well. You gotta learn it. You see there's some little gold specks in there. And we're going to put these under our microscope and see what these are. Just off the top of my head, they look like sulfides because of their boxy structure. They have very squared structures. Here's our little microscope. Let's zoom in on it a little bit and we'll get a better look. You see three pieces right there. The two pieces, in, well, the one piece in the center and the one on the left might be gold, but they do have a boxy structure, so they're probably pyrites. And then the one on the right, well, that was pyrite because it was, it looked like a, a cube. Once you get your pyrites out and get them all cleaned up, you put them into what we have here is a rotary roaster. You heat up the pyrites. 1700 degrees or so and it cooks off the sulfur breaks down the pyrite down into uh, sulfur gas and then it's indigenous uh, materials being either copper for copper pyrite or iron for iron pyrite or arsenic for arsenio pyrite that's not arsenio hall it's arsenio pyrite and once everything gets uh, roasted it turns black so this indicates that the pyrites are gone. You don't have little gold pieces in there anymore. The sulfur is baked away, and it's basically iron, and what trace gold there was will be inside this uh, little roaster here. Now from here, we go to smelting. We mix some flux in with the, uh, with the ore, and we cook it at uh, about 2,000 degrees, 2,200 degrees. It's just really hot. Probably cook a turkey in about four seconds. And once it's all cooked and ready to go, it takes about an hour to two hours to, to cook your ore. And uh, we pour it into a cone-shaped mold. Now the purpose behind this cone-shaped mold is we've added some lead to this uh, to the smelt and any of the gold particles the fine gold particles will hopefully glom together with the lead and settle to the bottom pouring it into the cone-shaped mold you'll wind up with a little conical shaped biscuit on the on the end that uh, should have all your precious metals in it if you want to take care of your crucibles, you'll put them back in the furnace and close your furnace and let them cool down at a nice steady pace. If you just leave your crucible out in the air, it's going to have a short life. Now this is the slag, the uh, black stuff that we've created from our homemade lava. Once the slag cools down, it has to cool down below 
say 300 degrees Fahrenheit um, because you don't want to flip this over and have the lead still molten inside. Lead melts at a lo much lower rate or a much lower temperature than the uh, than the slag. The slag's 2,000 degrees. Uh, the lead is 280 degrees. So you turn it over and hit it with a hammer and knock it loose. You see a little shiny tip on there. That's our lead. So we'll break it off our slag here. Now the slag, it's almost like obsidian. It's very sharp. You have to wear gloves. Here's our, our lead prill. That should contain our precious metals. So we'll take it over and hammer on it some and get all the slag that we can knocked off of it. Our next step is placing it into a coupel. A coupel is a small cup made of bone ash. Uh, some people use uh, Portland cement and make you know form their own coupels. But, uh, the coupel will absorb lead oxide. So as you heat up the lead prill to say 1700 degrees, 2000 degrees, the lead will form an oxide. The oxide, the lead oxide, will absorb into the coupel and it will leave behind your precious metals in a, in a small bead hopefully in the middle of your coupel. This is what we have before we start cooking it. And we'll run the temperature up. And start cooking. Once we've gotten up the temperature, the lead's melted. So here you just see melted lead. It's still a bit you know, shiny on the top. Once it gets to the oxidation state, you'll see fumes coming off. And you'll get a, a haze that will form over the top of the lead. That's lead oxide. Then it will immediately absorb into the compel. Now here's after it's all done. We hopefully will see a little flash of gold in the center. There it is. That little gold flash is the uh, gold solidifying. And the brown ring around the coupel is the lead that's been absorbed into it. There we go. And that's what your gold flash looks like. That's just a single frame. So that's coupelling. Now, of course, you are getting the whirlwind tour. So you don't expect too much right now as far as details. You take your little gold dot and drop it into a vial and after many attempts at getting gold, you'll have a bunch of little dots. So it's hard to get the camera to focus. But there's all my little dots, less than a quarter gram. And I'm afraid to even tell you how much I got invested in that so far. Far more than what it's worth. But, yeah, I'm having fun. And that's what counts. Well, that's about it for today. Hope you enjoyed the tour. Complimentary refreshments will be served in the garden. And don't forget to visit the gift shop. See ya!